All right, Jeremy. All right. Um, thanks for joining us um, on this Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to start off with scripture reading. So today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 119, 105 through 112. I'll give you a second to turn there. If you're Danae or Audra, you only need a second. All right. Um, the scripture reading says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Reserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees <laughs> to the very end. All right, um, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, thank you for um, your incredible uh, mercy and grace in our lives. Um, thank you first and foremost for Jesus who, um, upon which without him, um, none of this would be possible. Thank you for sending your son um, to take our place. And then God, thank you for um, giving us your word revealing yourself to us through um, your holy word. God, I pray that um, we would hide your word in our heart and that we would allow it to be um, a lamp unto our feet to guide our path as we walk through this world. Um, God, I pray, especially now as we're gathering together online, that we would um, still throughout the day and as we're away from each other, still find time to spend with you and to praise you and to worship you. Um, I pray that you would bless this morning. Prepare our hearts, God, to hear from you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sorry.
In the darkness we were awake Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and promise To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt No 
one can express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. Jim for uh, sharing that music. Um, I think you're up, Mr. Jeremy. Okay. Get the earthquake down. Can you guys all see that fine? All right, so um, it's good to be with you guys. Um, like Joe said, um, he kind of contacted me in the ninth hour and um, I was glad to do it because um, with the youth, we've been going through quiet times and we just finished the book of Jude. And um, the last part of Jude really, really impacted me. And I've been meditating on these verses for about a week now and um, just really enjoying what God showed me in them. Um, so I wanted to share them with you guys. Um, so I titled my message, A Joyous Weight, which um, sometimes seems counterintuitive. Oftentimes when we think of waiting, we don't think of it being joyful um especially my kids when they have to wait on things um they don't usually consider it joyful but um just a little background to the book of jude um pretty sure that jude was a half brother of jesus along with james um and even though he did not believe Jesus after the resurrection, um, at least him and James, um, and I think his other brothers too, um, believed and actually became leaders in the church. And so um, a little background uh, to the book of Jude. <clears throat> it starts out, um, Jude wanted to write about um, their shared salvation. He wanted to write a different letter, but in this, in the midst of writing this letter, he felt compelled or guided by the Holy Spirit um, to write something else. And this other letter that he wrote has to deal with the issue of contending for the faith. Um, he, he felt compelled to write to the church or his audience urging them to contend for the faith. Um, and the urgency, the reason he, he felt this urgency was because um, a group of apostates had slipped in to, in the midst of the church. And um, two of the, the main false teachings that these apostates were teaching 
was one, they were perverting the grace of God into a license for immorality. <laughs> um, so, and Um, this is not something that is uncommon or hasn't been happened before. In fact, Paul faced this exact problem in Romans um, where he almost deals with it prophetically. He, he talks about the grace of God. And then he's like, now some of you guys are going to say, well, if God is glorified by showing his grace, then shouldn't we sin so that God can show more grace and, and God is glorified? through that and Paul says may it never be um, and so I think time and time again human nature often tries to um, justify our own sin by twisting scripture and uh, one of the main teachings that they tried to do was to pervert um, God's grace and use it as a license to practice immorality um, the second main false teaching that they did is they denied Jesus Christ as um, Lord and Savior. They denied his sovereignty, his lordship. So um, that is the first couple of verses. And then a little bit more background. <clears throat> or, um, yeah, I, I found this definition. I think I found it at Christianity Today, but I really liked it. It said um, apostasy. Um, is the condition of having rebelled against God's truth as revealed in his holy word. Apostasy in the church is false teaching that results from a rejection or manipulation of the Bible in favor of one's own preference. The apostles warned the first century church to beware of apostates, those who abandon the truth of Christ for other doctrines. And so, um, <clears throat> these apostates had slipped into the midst of the church and were leading people astray. Um, and so Jude is urging them to contend for the faith. So in verses five through seven, he gives examples, um, three different examples of apostates. And then um, in verses eight through 10, he kind of gives us what to look for or how to spot a false teacher. And then verse 11, he, he gives a woe or a warning to those who practice apostasy. Um, and then finally, he gets to a warning for the church if they remain in their midst. And um, something that's not practiced well, at least in the church in America, is church discipline. And like other forms of discipline. Um, it's there for a reason. Church discipline is there to guard and protect the church, um, to help it remain pure and undefiled, to guard it against these false teachings that would come in. And um, oftentimes, we saw it with the church of Corinth, um, with different other churches, how they allowed these false teachers to come in. And, and we see it in today's age, too, where we almost become too tolerant, um, wanting to be accepting and on the basis of not wanting disunity will allow these people in our midst. And the warnings he gives to the church for allowing these people in their midst, he says they are blemishes, which first... I thought that meant um, <laughs> they're pimples, but um, <laughs> that's not what blemishes means. Um, it means like a reef or a rock that's hidden in the water. So it was something that was really dangerous for sailors or people on a boat. And it was like a hidden danger. Oftentimes they were dangerous because you didn't know they were there. And then you would run into them and they would um, cause holes in the side of the ship. So um, he says they're dangerous, they are blemishes, um, and their danger isn't perceived at first. Usually, oftentimes with false teachers, with, with apostates, we don't see they're dangerous until 
it's almost too late. Um, and so he warns them of that. He also says they are waterless clouds and fruitless trees. And this is an example he uses, but um, imagine you're a farmer and you desperately want rain and you see this cloud and you're like, oh good, but the cloud doesn't offer any kind of rain. Um, the same illustration is the same with the fruitless trees. You grow this tree expecting it to produce fruit, but it doesn't. And it's basically like their initial promise to bring something good will always um, come up vain in the end. And so these apostates, these false teachers will teach something that will sound attractive, but it'll always lead to destruction the end. It will always lead to a fruitless and empty pursuit. Um, and then he also warns that if you allow them into their midst, that they will cause divisions in the church. And we see that in verse 19. Um, so that's a little bit of background. I caught us up to um, verse 20, and that's where we're going to be in today. So turn in your Bibles to Jude. Um, chapter one, don't go to Jude chapter two. Um, we're not going to be in Jude chapter two today. Uh, Jude chapter one, verses 20 through 25. And it says, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Um, before we go any further, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for um, giving us the book of Jude and for using your Holy Spirit to guide him um, into writing an epistle that is applicable in today's age. Um, thank you again for giving us your word and, and how your word is profitable, in, in, incredibly profitable for us. Um, God, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would use your word to convict us of sin, you would use your Holy Spirit to encourage us if that is um, what we need. I pray that you would use your Holy Spirit to, uh, to build us up. Um, God, I pray that you would protect me from error, um, that you would allow your word to go forward with power, and that um, your people would um, be fed. I see things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, um, a joyous wait. Finally, in verse 20, um, Jude kind of changes pace here. Um, the Almost the whole entire book, he deals with these apostates, denouncing these apostates. Now he kind of turns to exhorting his audience. And how does he exhort them? Well, first he says, but you dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, here's the call, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. So his call is for them to keep themselves in God's love as they wait um, for Jesus Christ to bring them to eternal life. Now, 
Uh, remember the beginning of this book. Um, in this letter, he urges this church, his, his audience, to contend for the faith. And um, we see he kind of changes pace here because contending for the faith has the idea of opposing whatever seeks to distort or pervert our faith. But to contend for the faith when it is under attack, it means more than just um, defending against false teachers with um, arguments and words. It also involves um, living a life that is faithful to the gospel. And so now Jude is calling for his audience to keep themselves in God's love. He's exhorting them um, in this call. So what does it mean? What is, what is Jude meaning when he says, um, or when he's calling his audience to keep themselves in God's love? Well, um, I have two questions about this. What does it mean and how do we do this? To help us answer the first question, I think it would uh, benefit us. It would behoove us to clarify what it doesn't mean. Um, so Jude is not implying that those who are actual believers can somehow um, gain or lose God's love based upon their actions. And, and we'll see why not a little later. Um, if you are in Christ, you cannot gain favor from the Father because you are already maxed out. Um, you are already at full favor capacity. Is another way to say it. Um, God cannot look upon you any more favorably than he does right now. Why? Because of the work of Jesus Christ. Because those who are in Christ, when God looks upon us, he sees Christ. And, and being in Christ, that entitles all the benefits and blessings and good things that come along with being a son of God, a child of God. And so those who are actual believers can't somehow gain favor, gain love, or lose love with God based upon how they act. Um, another way to say this is um, because we are, God can't look upon us more favorably than he does right now. Um, God will never act toward us in a punitive, angry way. Um, punitive means to punish. He, he can't act towards us in a, con, um, a condemning way. Why? Because there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And this is incredibly encouraging and good news because those who are in Christ Jesus, Jesus bore that already. He bore that condemnation on the cross. He drank the full cup of God's wrath, right? Um, it pleased the Father to crush the Son. And now, because of what Christ has done, his disposition towards us can only be one of love because of our position in Christ. Um, because of the work that Christ has done. And, and it's this beautiful doctrine of um, substitutionary atonement where um, at the cross, Christ became our sin and gave us his righteousness. And we'll get into that a little bit later and, and the, the joy and the hope that that truth should bring. But um, what Jude is not saying here is that to keep themselves in God's love means that they can somehow gain God's love or lose God's love. Um, So um, if God can only act in a disposition of love towards us 
does God still discipline us? Well, absolutely. Even, even in his discipline, though, it is still an extension of his love. Um, Hebrews 12 talks about this. He says um, in Hebrews 12, um, verses 5 and 6, it says, My son, do not make light the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And then um, in verses 10, same chapter, it says, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So even God's discipline is not something that is fueled by anger or wrath. That has already been satisfied. He placed that upon his son, Jesus Christ. Now, if we are in Christ, his discipline is an extension of love. Hebrews makes it very clear. He disciplines the ones who he loves. God's discipline is for our good. It's for our benefit, even though we don't see it like that at times. Um, Hudson doesn't look at time out as being for his good, even though it makes things a lot more um, simpler. Um, he still views it as, um, you know, something that's harsh, something that is um, against him when really we do discipline our children because we want to train them and to doing what's right. And so even his discipline towards us is an extension of love. So um, Jude is not saying that his call to keep uh, themselves in God's love is not meaning that we can gain or lose God's love. Um, so what does it mean? I think very basically, and I, I studied this out pretty extensively, I think that this call to keep themselves in God's love is a call to persevere, um, a call to remain faithful, to keep working out their salvation in this corrupt and evil world. Now, how did I arrive at that? Well, um, I did a word study and I, I found, you know, it's always good to interpret scripture with scripture. Um, 1 John 2 talks about this idea and it says, um, 1 John 2 verse 15, it says, do not love the Lord, do not, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. I totally typed that out wrong. So it took me a second. Um, so it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. So First John is all about how to test if your faith is genuine. And I think here he's saying, for those who are genuine, keep pursuing God, keep remaining faithful, keep remaining in God's love. Don't fall after the world. Are there times, and in, in, as being a Christian, that we still sin? Absolutely. But our lifestyle should never be characterized by that. Um, are there times where we're tempted by the things of the world? Absolutely. But we should never be completely in a state of in love with the world. Um, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. And so I think this call to keep themselves in God's love as they wait for Christ's return is a call to remain faithful, a call to persevere in these um, wicked and sinful times. Um, so what does it mean? That's what I think it means. How do we do this? <laughs> um, well, he gives us that in the, the actually the first part of verse 20. Um, he says, but you, dear friends, by building yourself up in the most holy faith and 
praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself. So how do we keep ourselves? We keep ourselves by building. How do we keep ourselves in God's love? We do it by building ourselves up in our most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Um, John MacArthur says this about this text. He says, at the very heart of the matter of survival and triumphing in a day of apostasy is being strong in the faith, the most holy faith. It is not talking about subjective faith. That is your believing. It's talking about objective faith. That is the content of the gospel. In order to survive in a time of apostasy, above all things, it is absolutely essential that you be built up in your most holy faith, that you be strong in your understanding of Christian truth. Um, he later goes on to talk about being built up in your holy faith and the importance of <clears throat> being able to contend and defend your faith and, and know your faith being built upon this firm foundation that is um, and must be at the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. If we try and build anything else um, upon any other foundation, it'll be not sturdy, unsturdy. I can't think of a... a an antonym to sturdy. <laughs> it'll be un, it'll be non-sturdy if you try to build um, upon anything, if you try to build your faith upon anything other than Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I think a lot of times um, we fall into these dangers and, and, and MacArthur saw that this was a potential danger for the church. In fact, um, in his commentary, he, he later on goes to talk about a book that he wrote called Reckless Faith. And he wrote it because he thought the church had lost her will to discern. To discern what's right from wrong. Um, and Dr. MacArthur was convinced that evangelicals no longer cared about sorting truth from error, sorting out lies from deception, that we were gullible, that we could literally be led astray, that they were all embracing this idea of tolerance that was coming rapidly. And, you know, to an extent, um, I, I feel like that is one of the big struggles of the Church of America is I think in a big way, we have lost our ability to discern truth from error. And we see a lot of liberal churches, churches that are moving away from orthodoxy, that are moving away from solid doctrine into this new relative truth type age thing. Um, and so he talks about this book that he wrote. And when he started the book, um, he started the book by telling a story about traveling across America And um, him and his wife were traveling across America, and his wife really likes quilts. So they were in Arkansas, middle of nowhere, and they're on a two-lane two road, and they saw this shack. And there's this little sign that said quilts, kind of like, you know, those little garage sale signs where they write out garage sale, and they, like, have an arrow pointing to where it's at. It was like that. So um, him and his wife find themselves in this little rink-a-dink shack in the middle of Arkansas looking for quilts. And this lady brings out, um, I don't know if it was her house or her store or both, but she brings out this quilt that she had made. And uh, Dr. MacArthur says, I'll never forget, the lady brought out a quilt that she had been working on <laughs> And it was the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. It had no rhyme or reason. 
It was a piece of everything that had ever happened in her life. Every piece, um, every piece of clothing that had ever come across her vision was sewn into that quilt. He said it was completely indescribable. And all he could say after looking at it was, my, that is a quilt. <laughs> um, then he politely said, I don't think that is quite the color I'm looking for since it wasn't really a color at all. And at the same time, every color. Um, he asked her if she had something else. And she showed him this other quilt that was blue. And he said, I bought it because it made sense to me. Um, but while he was talking with her, her husband came into the room and um, they had this conversation with her husband, who is an interesting guy. And, and so they sat talking to the husband and um, around his chair, he had stacks of literature piled up. Um, and so while uh, John MacArthur is talking to him, he's, he's sorting through um, the stacks, you know, just kind of looking at what the guy's reading. And he says he had everything from unity to Christian science, the Mormons, fundamentalists, Roman Catholics, all this religious literature, uh, Unitarian, Unitarians, um, and everything in between. And I said to him, I said, you know, and John MacArthur speaking, he said, and I said to the man, you got an awful lot of different religious literature here. And he said, I'll never forget this. The man looked at him and said, and there's good in all of it. And he realized at that moment that his wife had quilted his theology. That quilt was a living tribute to this man's theology. There was not good in all of it, right? In fact, there's um, evil in all of it, except for what is true. And, and so that's how he started this book, this idea that we've been tricked into thinking that each different religion can offer us something of benefit. And so we kind of create this Build-A-Bear type religion where we start taking from all these different sectors and then we pour it all into you know, our foundation and we think what we've come up with is good when really it's not. If our foundation is anything but Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it won't last, it won't stand firm. Um, so we can't, we, I, I mean, just imagine um, trying to build a foundation and you're just adding all these different ingredients, you know, take a little bit of concrete here, um, some mud and clay here, some wood here for the termites, some marble because we're fancy, um, some terraz because we, we, we just visited the Sowers house. Um, and we, we pour all this stuff into trying to make this foundation. It would not be very functional. And so we as a church need to guard ourselves from this idea and um, use scripture as um, the final authority on what is true and what is not true and interpret what we determine as truth through scripture um, and not through personal experience, not through personal revelation. Um, we have to interpret what is true through scripture because God has given us scripture um, as a guard. And so, um, we have to build our faith upon a sure foundation. So um, how do we guard um, or how do we contend for the faith? How do we, I'm sorry, um, how do we keep ourselves in God's love? One, we build ourselves up in this most holy faith. And then two is um, we pray in the spirit. And um, it's actually a pretty cool word study on what it means to pray in the spirit. What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean speaking in tongues. Um, to pray in the spirit, um, quite simply, I mean, the opposite of spirit is flesh. 
And so we need to acknowledge that prayer is a spiritual activity. And, you know, if we try to pray in our own flesh, relying on our own strength, it's going to turn up empty and vain. We have to rely on the spirit. And in fact, the spirit, um, Paul talks about in Romans, how the spirit helps us in our times of weakness when we pray. And so this idea of praying in the spirit is relying on the spirit to guide us into what to pray for, how to pray. Um, and so we need to build our self, our, um, build ourselves in the most holy faith and then pray in the Holy Spirit. And that's how uh, we keep ourselves in God's love as we wait upon the Lord Jesus Christ in these last days. And then um, in verses 22 and 23, it talks about contend for the faith can't only be defensive. We must also go on the offensive. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we as Christians, our only efforts to contend for the faith are to research um, false teachers and work on calling them out. That's only part of what we're called to do. We're missing another big part. Um, contending for the faith means going out there. Remember that while we wait for Jesus' return, we've been given the Great Commission. In Mark 16, 15, it tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every cre uh, creature. And so we aren't supposed to just sit at home behind our keyboards and become great online apologists. We're also supposed to go out into the world and reach our neighbors and people of other nations um, and, and spread the gospel. And so um, what Jude is saying here is he's saying, um, as we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to bring us to eternal life, we need to be merciful to those who doubt. And um, I put down in my mind, I, I put down, this is, a re, this is the, the idea of reaching out to those. Um, and there's kind of three groups that Jude talks about. He says, be merciful to those who doubt, save others by snatching them from fire, to others show mercy mixed with fear. So um, I wanna deal with the three kinds of people Jude calls us to reach. And remember that while we wait for Jesus' return, um, one of the main reasons Jesus hasn't returned that he talks about in Second Peter is um, he, um, Peter deals with this idea it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So one of the reasons why um, Jesus has not come back already is because he's wanting more people to come to repentance, to come to true faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so... Um, we need to remember that we can't just be um, online apologists. We have to go out and share our faith. Um, and, and the three kinds of people Jude calls us to reach. The first is the confused. Um, it says, save others or um, be merciful to those who doubt. There's so many people who are searching in this world. There's so many people who say they are open to truth, but if they're open to truth, they're also open to error. Um, I mean, they're, they're searching. They don't know what they're searching for. It's like we've, and, and you've seen these people too. They drift in and out of church. Um, they say, well, I like going to church because I like that music, or I go to church and they kind of view it more as like a self-help group um, or they go to church because they want their kids to be in church. 
And these people that we're going to call the confused, the first people Jude talks about that we are to reach, these people are the first victims of most false teachers and false religions. And um, it is up to us to show mercy to them. And how do we show mercy to them? How do we show kindness to them? By sharing with them the truth that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would be wrong for a doctor to withhold the truth from their patient if that patient was sick. It's also wrong for us not to proclaim the truth because we think it might rub them the wrong way or it might be something that is hard for them to hear. And so we need to show mercy to these people who are oftentimes um, the first people that are um, picked on by false teachers and uh, false religions. Um, people are searching for the truth and, and we have the answer. And so um, it would benefit us and them if we were to share that. Um, just the, an idea of how crafty they are. Veronica dealt with a group of Jehovah Witnesses and they, they would come in the middle of the day when I would be away. And it took three times that they visited our house before she even realized that they weren't Christians because they would craft their speech in such a way to agree with everything Veronica would say and make her think that they were on the same side. And then ever so slightly would they start to add in things and try and turn the conversation. And I think she actually realized that they weren't Christians and that they were actually Jehovah Witnesses because in one of their literatures, I think they forgot to hide the Watchtower logo. Um, but I mean, these, these people are very crafty. And so um, we need to be merciful to those who are doubting, to those who are confused. The second group we are called to reach is the convinced. This group, our task gets a little harder because they are no longer on the fence. In fact, they are now on the wrong side of the fence, hence Jude's wording here of snatching. Um, it literally means um, to go and grab. And so it, it involves action. These people are against our faith, but that doesn't mean that they need to hear the truth of the gospel any less. Um, and then the final group is the committed. And these are the apostates that are committed to their deceptions. We are still called to reach this group, but Jude says to show mercy with fear. And the fear here is acknowledging the danger these apostates present to us. Um, John MacArthur says, when dealing with these people, we are in serious danger because these apostates are so deeply deceived, so profoundly deceived. Very often they are articulate and they have been trained to articulate their system. They know how to give the answers. They are subtle and slippery. They are missionaries of air. They are teachers of their lies. And when you get near them, it is a dangerous place to be. But these people still need to hear the gospel and still need to be reached. And so Jude calls them, show mercy to them, but show it with fear. Um, recognizing the danger that they possess. And um, one of my favorite verses when, when dealing with this idea of showing mercy to those who are apart from Christ, I, I believe it's in Ephesians 2, and it just popped into my head, so I don't have it written down. I apologize, but it talks about um, how we who are dead in our trespasses and sin, and it talks about our helpless state, and it says, but God, I think it says, but God, being rich in mercy, showed his love towards us. And so, guys, we need to be, um, we need to remember that 
we were once dead in our trespasses and sins and God showed his mercy towards us. And so we need to take that mercy that we've received and we need to proclaim this good news to other people, to those who need to hear him. And so <clears throat> as we wait for Christ's return, we're to contend for the faith, but it can't just be this defensive contending against apostates. We must also go on the offensive, remembering the great commission that God has given us. And then finally, he ends with this doxology, which is an expression of praise towards God. And um, he says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great glory, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. So two things that he really calls out here. Uh, we praise him because he is able to keep us from stumbling. Um, and this idea deals with the doctrine of the uh, perseverance of the saints. Yes, <clears throat> um, we may still struggle with sin and our, our walk with God may sometimes feel like two steps forward, two steps back and we feel stagnant at times, and we feel like we're in the wilderness. But, but God has given us several promises, and this being one of them, that he is able to keep us. This, this keeping is not based upon our own actions. It's not based upon our own ability. It is based upon God. And that is something that should cause great joy and hope to rise up in every believer because God is the one who keeps us. Um, John talks about this idea. It says, um, I give them eternal life and they shall never, never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. And so um, he is able to keep us because he is greater than anyone else. Satan, temptation, the world, nothing can snatch us out of the father's hands. Not even a professional plucker um, who's tried to pluck for life the unpluckable the song i swear um god is able to keep us and that is something that is incredibly joyous um another verse that comes to mind is he who started a good work in you will bring it to completion he is the author and the perfecter of our faith and so we praise him because he is able to keep us from stumbling and the second reason is we praise him who is able to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. And how is he able to do that? He's able to do that. Give me a second. There we go. Um, he's able to do that because, oh, I'm getting bad Wi-Fi, so I apologize. He's able to do that because of Christ's righteousness. Because at the cross, Jesus Christ became our sin and gave us his own righteousness. Um, and, and because we have obtained the righteousness of Christ, he is able to present us without fault and with great joy. And so I hope as we meditate on these um, promises that God gives us in these last few verses that, that they would cause a great joy within us. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, thank you for um, being the author and the perfecter of our faith, being the one who we rely on. Um, God, I thank you that 
your promises are true and that we can hope in them. And as Paul says, that is a sure hope. Um, so God, I pray that as we wait upon the second coming of Christ, as we wait upon our bridegroom, that we would be a church that would persevere, that we would contend for the faith, that we would um, remain faithful, that we would um, keep ourselves pure from false teachers and false teachings. And then God, that you would use us as a tool to reach those who are lost, those who are confused or convinced or committed. That I pray that we would be able to reach the lost with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. As these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Jeremy.